Hello and welcome to the final time period review for AP World History in preparation for the AP exam. And we're going to be focusing on 1900 to the present, which is going to cover through three units, units seven, eight, and nine. So we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Um, first thing I want you all to understand is that there is a shifting power after 1900. So the 20th century sees the shift in political powers. We're going to see some traditional established empires from the 19th century get undermined and um, begin to erode. Now, one of those empires are going to be the Western empires, but we're going to talk more about that in when we get into decolonization. And we also have the collapse of the Russian, the Ottoman, and the Qing empires. So for Russia, the collapse of the Russian empire comes in 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution that brings in the Communist Party under Lenin um, and then later dominated by Stalin. And this communist regime is going to go from 1917 till 1991. The Ottoman Empire is going to be broken up as a result of World War I, but the Ottoman Empire had been threatened by nationalistic movements well before World War I began. The Ottoman Empire, if you remember, was trying to keep itself together through the Young Turk movement, which was trying to modernize the Ottoman Empire while maintaining the Turkish domination over other ethnic groups that were part of the empire. World War I puts the Ottoman Empire on the losing side, and pretty soon the empire breaks up along those um, ethnic divisions. However, the Turkish state of the Republic of the Turkey, sorry, Republic of Turkey, is going to be the continuity of the former Ottoman Empire. And finally, in China, we see the revolution of 1911 ending the dynastic cycle of governments and bringing in a republic, um, you know, with the revolution against the Qing. That was led by Dr. Sun Yat-sen and the Nationalist Party called the Kumatang Party. And we also see another challenge to the existing political and social rev order in the Mexican Revolution of 1910. From about the 1870s to 1910, there is a leader named Diaz who is president of Mexico. And during Diaz's presidency, he's going to maintain the, the social and economic inequalities that are inherent within a, a system that favors the, the small group of landowners over everyone else. Diaz is gonna work closely with the Western powers to increase investments in Mexico and he and a few of his um, supporters are going to profit, but these riches are not really shared out amongst the population. So there's a large demand for land reform and a push to kind of um, rectify those, those inequalities. That, that attempt is going to come in the hands of a, form of rev a revolution in 1910, which brings to power a more well, revolutionary group that is pushing for government control of, of industries, keeping Western um, presence at bay, and distributing wealth amongst the larger population. Then we go into causes of World War I. Now, I know everybody since 1919 have been saying, here are the main causes. I always like to use the acronym MANIA. Militarism, which is a big emphasis on spending money to build up one's army, navy, air, well, there's no Air Force yet, but to build up the military. A, alliances. And alliances, the two we really want to know are the Triple Alliance, which have Germany, Italy, and Austria, against the Triple Entente, which has Britain, France, and Russia. And the big thing about alliances during World War I is that any time one little conflict begins, there's the risk that everybody will be sucked into the conflict. N is for nationalism which is more than just a patriotic love of one's nation, but it's also a belief that your nation is superior to all other nations and all other nations are out to get you. And then your eye is imperialism. And during the 19th century, imperialism had created rivalries between the European states. And these rivalries are gonna help to feed in to the revolution or to the World War I. And then lastly, A, the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand. There has to be some spark to unleash everything. And that's what the assassination does. So the emphasis is on competition. All of these things, what they have in, co in common is that they create a competitive mindset that you need to look out for your own best interest because nobody else will. 
and it makes you distrustful to other parties. It makes you think that they're looking out for themselves and therefore you need to be extra cautious and you need to be suspicious. So what happens is that if you give an inch, what you're doing is you're showing weakness in the situation. So there becomes a mindset of holding firm lines, demanding and having ultimatums of one another. And it can easily, this competitive environment can easily become a warfare environment. So a couple particulars to take a look at, just to be aware that this is going on. Germany and Britain are having a rivalry against each other that is starting to escalate, um, particularly over a naval arms race. So Germany is building up its Navy. Britain responds by building up its Navy. Britain sees Germany as challenging their supremacy on the sea. So they get suspicious of Germany's intentions. Germany sees Britain as um, a domineering nation that needs to be kind of brought back down to everybody else. So this rivalry is gonna feed into the beginning of World War I. And then we have another rivalry between the Austrian Empire and the Serbian state. The Serbian state is trying to unify the Slavic people in the Balkan Peninsula. Austria has occupied or has annexed land that contain a number of Slavic people. One of these pieces of land is Bosnia-Herzegovina. So Serbia wants Bosnia, Austria has Bosnia, that creates a rivalry over that piece of land. Serbia, the pan-Slavic movement, is really just nationalism. And what Austria is doing is trying to maintain its influence, its imperial influence, so you can kind of tie that to imperialism a little bit. And then we have a French-German rivalry that dates back to the 19th, well, dates back earlier than that. But in the 19th century, there was a war between France and Germany that France lost big time. And France had to surrender a chunk of land to Germany called Alsace-Lorraine. This creates a bitterness. And when we get up to World War I, that bitterness is going to contribute to the start of this world war. So the war begins. You don't need to get obsessed about how it begins. You don't need to get into the details. You need to see how militarism, alliances, nationalism, imperialism, and the assassination all played a role. Once the war starts, we want to be able to conduct the war. In other words, how did the war go? And there's one thing I'm going to add at the end. One, World War I is a total war, where a nation mobilizes all of its resources to fight the conflict. So what this means is that total war means everybody's engaged. It's more than just the soldiers, but all parts of the economy, all parts of society. They are directed towards the war. The war is all-encompassing. Um, people's attention. And that means you're going to mobilize all the resources you have available. So for example, you're going to mobilize women into the workforce to take the factory jobs that men are leaving behind to go off and fight. You're going to increase recruiting to pull young men into the armed forces in order to fight, um, fight this war. You're going to go to, if you're a European country, you're going to go to the colonies and you're going to get colonial subjects to serve in your army and the fight the war you know, with you so that you have more manpower and, and you can carry out the conflict at a higher degree. Um, you're gonna mobilize the civilian population. You're gonna ask them to ration. You're gonna ask them to give things up. You're gonna ask them to buy war bonds so that you can collect more money to pay for the war while you're fighting. So that's what we mean by mobilization. And one of these aspects of total war mobilization is the form of propaganda. The idea of creating, um, you know, using media, particularly posters, um, visual media, to encourage people to recruit, to encourage people to buy war bonds, to raise resources, and to keep people's support of the war up by demonizing the enemy or by emphasizing patriotism. The other thing about conducting World War I is the new military technology, particularly the machine gun. And the machine gun is going to inflict um, significant casualties on both sides. Because here we have a 20th century technology, but people are still fighting in with 19th century tactics. And this piece of technology of the machine gun is going to be critical to leading you to trench warfare and to the high casualty rate that nobody expected at the beginning of this war. Now, I should include one more thing about mobilization is that the economy of a country, the industrial economy of a country 
is going to be geared towards production for the war. And that's what makes World War I unique in the sense that it's one of the first truly industrialized wars. Now, the fifth thing that I want to add in is the Treaty of Versailles. And so some of the things to know about the Treaty of Versailles, it is what we call a dictated peace. In other words, Germany was told to sign the treaty. Germany wasn't involved in the treaty process. So it was a peace that was forced upon Germany. Among other things, it holds Germany guilty for the war. This is what we call the war guilt clause. Because Germany is responsible for the war, they have to pay reparations. So that's the second thing to be aware of. The third thing to be aware of with the Treaty of Versailles is that it demilitarized the German army. It took the German military and reduced it significantly. And it also disarmed a lot of the German military. And then the fourth thing to realize about the Treaty of Versailles is that it engages, it engages in the self-determination um, you know, mindset. It says that these nations in East Europe who have been under the Austrian and German and Russian empires deserve to have their own nations. So new nations are created because of the Treaty of Versailles. Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, um, the independent state of Hungary. Um, those are your three big ones. And Romania can also be thrown in there as well. But the idea is that these new nations, and Poland, Poland's the other big one. These new nations are kind of an outgrowth of the nationalist mindset that an ethnic group of people deserve to have its own nation. But what's important to note is that this only extended to East European states. In the rest of the world, in the non-European parts of the world, this type of self-determination wasn't extended. We'll talk more about that in a second. And then the fifth thing to remember about the Treaty of Versailles is the League of Nations. And the League of Nations is uh, an attempt to create an international body to prevent future conflicts like World War I from happening again. So when we advance to the next slide, we look at the economy and the interwar period. So World War I is over. We go into the 1920s and the 1930s, and we're going to kind of jump all around. In, the 29, in 1929, there's a stock market crash that's going to be the catalyst for a Great Depression, but the Great Depression had been building up for some time. So there's going to be economic challenges, particularly in the 1930s. We even see the, those challenges in the 1920s as, as Europe is attempting to recover from World War I. The depression hits a lot of people hard. It's going to increase unemployment, and it's not just limited to Europe or the United States, but it's a global phenomenon. So colonies are gonna get hit tremendously hard. An export-based economy that relies on trade in the Great Depression is gonna suffer significantly because the demand for what they're exporting is gonna drop significantly, which means that they won't be able to support their economy and since they're a one-trick pony, this hurts them significantly. So what you have to understand is that the government is going to increase its role in the economy. The government is going to assume more responsibility for the health of the economy. And this is very much a reaction to the Great Depression. So Great Depression happens. It's kind of like now there's no going back. The government goes, we can't just sit back and let things correct themselves we need to take a more active role in the economy. Now, this is a complete violation of laissez-faire, and that's where we pull in a philosopher named Keynes. And the Keynesian economic theory says, in the long run, we're all dead. So what the government should do is engage in deficit spending in an effort to get the economy going again. And that way you could ride out the, the dips in the economic cycles. And then once things got going again, you can have the government, you know, take out what it's been putting in. So the idea is, you know, to prime the pump with deficit spending to keep the economy going when the economy takes a downturn. And that way you decrease suffering. So some examples of this, the New Deal in the United States under FDR certainly made use of that philosophy. In Germany and Italy, there's a fascist movement. Now, the fascists are a nationalist movement, an ultra-nationalist movement, which emphasizes the supremacy of the state above all else. And so therefore, the economy needs to serve the strength of the state. A strong economy means a strong state. 
So the government is going to be involved, but the government is going to make sure that all economic decisions always reflect what, in their opinion, is the best interest of the state. The other thing is that the fascist governments are going to spend a great deal of money. They're going to pump money into the economy. And we look no further than Hitler in, in Nazi Germany, where he started to pump a lot of money into the highway systems and also into rearming Germany. That government money being introduced is going to create jobs. It's going to start dealing with unemployment. It's going to bring unemployment down and economic activity will increase. In the Soviet Union, we have something different. We have Stalin's five-year plans. So when the Soviet Union goes communist, there's a leader named Lenin. Lenin puts in the new economic plan. And the new economic plan or the new economic policy is new economic plan is to allow peasants to engage in capitalism, to allow them to engage in free market enterprise in the hopes of stimulating agricultural production again. When Stalin comes along, he proposes something different. He says, we are going to rapidly industrialize the Soviet Union with a series of five-year plans. And in order to accomplish these five-year plans, which is a government-focused thing, we're going to take control of the farmlands, which is called collectivization, in order to direct the food to the cities so our workers have the food to eat so that they can be more productive. Now, the five-year plans, of course, is going to lead to mass starvation. And it's also going to lead to conflict between the central government, the Communist Party, and the, the farming population. Then we go to Brazil. In Brazil, there is a leader named Vargas. Vargas. And Vargas, he, he, he looks up to Mussolini and Hitler. So you can say that his party tends fascist. And he puts another plan out there called the New State, which is an attempt to bring the different elements of the economy into cooperation so that the state is best served. And finally, in Mexico, we have the Cardenismo. Now, this is a movement of, of a president who says, I'm going to nationalize the oil industry and I'm going to engage in land reform where land is going to be taken from the large landowners and redistributed amongst the peasants. So all five of these cases are examples of an increased role of government in the economy. And they're in the 1930s and the 1940s. We, we see this you know, all the way up to today. And then we also have unresolved tensions after World War I that start to blow up in the interwar years. And most of these revolve around colonial tensions after World War I. So the expectation amongst many of these colonial tensions I'm sorry, these colonial states, was that by serving and helping the mother countries during World War I, they would gain independence, that they would get that self-determination. And when the Treaty of Versailles came out, the opposite happened. The Treaty of Versailles granted self-determination to the Europeans, but not to non-European colonies who had supported the Europeans, Britain, France, um, during World War I. So we see these tensions play out in India. India is, is, is one country who's deeply disappointed by the fact that they don't get autonomy. That's what the, the hope was. Instead, what they got was more restrictions. And when there is a gathering at the Amritsar temple, the British determined that the crowd is in violation of these restrictions and open fire, leading to what we call the Amritsar massacre. The Amritsar massacre is significant because this pushes most South Asians over the edge to the point where they go, the British have to go. And in a lot of ways, the, the independence movement, the true independence movement of India alone comes out of the Amritsar massacre. In Korea, there is anger over Japan still having all this control over Korea. And they, that becomes a series of demonstrations and protests called the March 1st Movement. China, when it reads the Treaty of Versailles, see that a piece of Chinese land, a peninsula that was owned by Germany as a colony, has been transferred to Japan instead of back to China. So this May 4th Movement is an anti-imperialism, anti-Japanese movement. And it does have a Chinese nationalism to it. Um, you know, this emphasis that China should be able to control its own affairs. In Africa, many of the African colonies were disappointed at the lack of freedom 
um, you know, after World War I because they served in the, the military and they were expecting self-determination and they got nothing. So where we see it probably best is in the labor unrest. In West Africa, we have a railroad strike in 1917, and then we have a general strike in 1948. And the idea is to see that there's a lot of laborers who go, we're done, you know, working according to these discriminatory policies. And we want better pay, we want better conditions, we want better treatment. Finally, we go over to Indochina, which if you remember, involves Vietnam. And the Vietnamese nationalist group sends representatives to the Treaty of Versailles Conference. And they're not listened to, they're largely ignored. And now we're seeing much more of a resistance against the French, saying to the French that they're not living up to the ideals of their own revolution. So these tensions are rising. That's the big thing to know. Now, it doesn't mean that they've been decolonized, but Europe is starting to look for an exit strategy in the 1920s and 30s. And, you know, there's no way of going back to the 19th century. Contributing to this is the Versailles Settlement. The Versailles Settlement is a big reason for increasing tensions between the colonies and the colonial powers. One deals with the settlement of the German colonies. The idea is that the German colonies, instead of getting their own independence, they become either controlled by the League of Nations or they become mandates of the British and the French. And the other thing is that as the Ottoman Empire breaks up, there's um, a group called the Arabs who were expecting, and this is a common theme, they were expecting greater independence, greater autonomy for helping the British fight against the Ottomans. And instead, what they see is increased European presence within the Middle East. And this is going to provoke an Arab movement. The Arab movement is an anti-Western, pro-Arab nationalist sentiment. To, to kind of kick out the Western influences. And then finally, and I mentioned this, the self-determination for East European countries such as Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Romania, Hungary, the list goes on and on. But the idea is that those countries get these, <laughs> this autonomy and freedom that other countries wanted. We could also talk about Ireland. Um, Ireland has the Easter Rebellion and eventually that's going to, because Ireland was expecting home rule, but then World War I gets in the way. Britain doesn't grant the home rule, and Ireland starts to push back. And this starts to lead to an Irish-English conflict that will eventually result in the birth of the Republic of Ireland in 1922. So those colonial tensions are undermining the, the system of imperialism. Then we get World War II. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but what caused World War II? The Versailles Settlement created resentment within Germany. Germany didn't feel that it was fair to take on this war guilt or to pay these reparations, and they felt insulted by the demilitarization um, policies. And that leads to basically grievances amongst the German people. Hitler and the Nazis were able to play off of those grievances one of the keystones or the cornerstones of the Nazi party is that they are anti-Versailles. To them, the Versailles settlement is just a piece of trash that should be ignored. The second thing is the Great Depression, because the Great Depression starts to dramatically change the economies, particularly in Germany. And what happens is that the Nazi party is able to say, look at this economic mess, the government in power can't fix it, so give us the chance to fix everything. And the other thing is I put in there imperialist policies, because what happens soon after is that dictators in Japan, Italy, and Germany, they basically say, you know what the answer is to the Great Depression? We need to expand. We need to take more territory. So this is going to lead Italy to invading Ethiopia. It's going to lead Germany to invading everybody. Um, it's going to lead Japan, I'm sorry, um, yes, Japan, going through South, Southeast um, Asia and into the South Pacific. So World War II happens because of increasing aggression from these three countries. And when Japan attacks China, that's basically the start of World War II in Asia. When Germany attacks Poland, that's what gets the British and the French involved. And then Japanese aggression in Pearl Harbor gets us involved. So it all kind of roots from these authoritarian governments taking a more aggressive approach and aggressive tactics 
as a way of resolving the problems created by the Great Depression. So conducting World War II, the good news is you just look back at World War I. The concept of total war and mobilization, women are going to work in the factories again. We, we have the industrial society producing more and more weapons, ammunition um, to support the war. The civilian population is rationing and the weapons of war are more devastating and more deadly. So the basic idea is you take everything you got from World War I and you just say, it's on a bigger scale. The government is going to increase its power and authority, particularly the Nazi party. So the ability of the government to take control of the economy, the ability of the government to direct people to, to, to serve the best interests of the nation, regardless of how the people feel, the government is becoming increasingly powerful. If you look at the United States putting Japanese um, American citizens into internment camps, and having that be upheld by the Supreme Court represented this idea of an increased government power in the, in the guise of a national emergency. And finally, I put in this part about technology and increased civilian casualties. So the idea is that with new technologies, the civilian casualty rate is going to go up. And this is largely from aerial bombing. The type of bombs that are being used is going to increase the devastation and death that can be inflicted because of war. So you get atomic bombs, you get fire bombings, you just get um, more bombs, more destructive bombs. And that's going to impact the whole civilian casualty, civilian population in a way that we didn't necessarily see in World War I. Certainly the civilians were affected by World War I, but World War II, you have 30 to 50 million civilians displaced or dead or wounded because of this conflict. So that's so one type of atrocity is the genocide. Um, in World War I, it's inflicted upon the Armenians by the Ottoman Empire. In World War II, of course, we all are familiar with the Holocaust. And, you know, when we talk about the Holocaust, we kind of focus on the Jewish population of Europe. If you talk about other persecutions carried out by the Nazi regime, you can get lots of different groups that are in there. In Cambodia in 1970, with the emergence of the uh, Khmer Rouge, which is a communist government that takes over Cambodia, um, there's going to be a genocide carried out against different groups of people who are seen as enemies of the state, which eventually resulted in about 25% of the population being killed within about a five year time period. And then in Rwanda, we have two ethnic groups that end up, there's a group called the Tutsi who are gonna be blamed for cooperating with the West. And um, as, as we see in Rwanda, um, as a fallout of decolonization, there'll be tensions between ethnic groups and that will lead to a genocide carried out um, in the 1990s. And of course, we can keep it going all the way up to today, but there's, there's plenty of examples of genocide. Famine is another type of mass atrocity that's going to affect a large population. The five-year plans under Stalin led to widespread food shortages that lead to famine, particularly within the Ukraine. In China, it's called the Great Leap Forward, and the policies made by the government is going to inflict famine amongst the population, um, resulting in tens of millions dead. In Ethiopia, drought com com um, combined with poor government policy will create a famine throughout the 1980s. And then, of course, total war has its impact on the civilian population. I think that's something you can understand. And then lastly, the impact of World War I. So one thing is that after World War I, a pandemic is going to break out called the pandemic of 1918 or the influenza pandemic of 1918. As soldiers go home, they introduce a strand of the flu to these populations that have not been connected to it. And um, as a result, we have widespread infection, we have widespread death. And then I want to bring in, it's not so much a mass atrocity, but the social emotional impact of this on a generation that survived this called the lost generation. And the lost generation is going to live through World War I and a pandemic 
and they're going to see tens of millions of people die. That's going to impact literature. That's going to impact philosophy. That's going to impact art. That's going to come out because this generation of 20 to 40 year olds are, you know, they're in their formative years and they're going to be heavily influenced by this, by this very depressing period of time because everything they ever believed in is being shattered by these events, which is going to cause them to question everything. And then when we look at this skill, causation and global conflict, you just want to understand how all of these are caused by something else. And if you notice, there's a heavy emphasis on causation throughout this uh, particular unit. All right, so that's one of three units down. Now we'll go to Cold War and decolonization. So to set the stage for Cold War and decolonization, you have to understand that World War II does two things. One, World War II devastates just about everybody except for the Soviet Union and the United States. So the Cold War kind of leave these two very powerful countries still standing, while other used to be powerful countries have collapsed. The other thing with the impact of World War II is that those countries that have collapsed economically and you know, in terms of morale, they were the imperial powers. And they are not in a position to maintain those imperial presences um, going forward, which is going to contribute to decolonization. And then, of course, the impact of atomic weaponry is going to raise the stakes um, because now we have this weapon of mass destruction that is capable of, of bringing a great deal of, of death and misery. And so that's going to be driving the Cold War especially. So let's look at the Cold War. Well, one I kind of already did at the impact of World War II. The Soviet Union and the United States are the last two standing, essentially. And the Soviet Union also wants a buffer zone with the West, as they had been invaded by the West a couple times. So that's going to create two different visions of the future. The United States wants governments in Eastern Europe to be free and democratic. The Soviet Union wants them to be friendly to communism, in other words, communist states. So this begins the schism, or this, this widens the gap between the two that leads us to the Cold War, which is a war that doesn't actually have direct military conflict, but the conflict shows up in other ways. It's an ideological conflict between the political system of democracy and the authoritarian nature of the Communist Party. And it's also an economic competition between capitalism and communism. And both copy, capitalism and communism want the same thing. They want to spread their ideas and bring more people into their fold. Now, there's a third way called the development of the non-aligned movement. And there's two names that I put up there, Sukamo and Nkrumah. So Sukamo is the leader of Indonesia. Nkrumah is the leader of Ghana. And these are going to be two particular voices that reject the idea of having to align themselves with one or the other. And this non-aligned movement is going to be made up of many former colonies who look with suspicion at siding with the United States or with the Soviet Union because it could open the door up for a new form of colonization. So the non-aligned movement is an attempt to stay out of the Cold War. Okay, the effects of the Cold War. We have creations of new military alliances like NATO, which is the United States and her allies, and the Warsaw Pact, which is the Soviet Union and the Eastern European bloc, which would include Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, formed into a military alliance to counteract NATO. NATO's purpose is to prevent the spread of communism. The Warsaw Pact's purpose is to protect against an invasion from the West. Now, even though the Soviet Union and the United States did not have a direct conflict, there were proxy wars. And proxy wars are gonna pit, are gonna be stand-ins for the conflict. So we see these proxy wars in three places in particular. Actually, I would put in a fourth. The Korean War, North Korea is communist, South Korea is a republic. The, the Soviet Union supports the North Koreans who are fighting against the South Koreans and the American allies. So American troops are coming up against North Korean soldiers who are armed with Soviet weaponry. That's an example of a proxy war. The Angolan Civil War, 
Again, Angola has broken away in 1975, and three ethnic groups kind of vying for power. One ethnic group is communist leading, so the Soviet Union supports that group. Another group is anti-communist, so the US supports that group. And we send in funny funds and military aid, and basically we arm both sides, and it becomes we're, we're fighting vicariously through them. And in Nicaragua, we have the Sandinistas and the Contra. The Sandinistas are the, the Communist Party, and the Contras are the anti-communist party. And again, the United States steps in and supports the Contras, while there is Soviet support of the Sandinistas, and it's our way of fighting each other without actually fighting. And the fourth one that I would add in is Afghanistan. When, when the Soviets invade Afghanistan, we step in and support the rebels with, um, with military aid and military weaponry in, you know, as a way of frustrating and making that war painful for the Soviet Union. The other effect of the Cold War is nuclear proliferation, which basically means the buildup of nuclear arms. And this is what we call an arms race. So throughout the 1960s, both sides, the US and the Soviet Union, are spending more and more money to build more and more missiles to build more and more nuclear submarines and to build more and more bombers that can carry the atomic and deliver atomic weaponry or nuclear bombs. So this arms race is going to proliferate the number of, you know, weapons of mass destruction. We're going to get into the thousands at some point where you could blow the world up seven times over and wipe out all humanity. And the thing is, is that while all these nuclear weapons may be building up, there is this concept called mutually assured destruction, which basically ensures that nobody's going to take the shot. Because if I strike first, the other side has time to strike back and everybody loses. And we also see the competition between the US and the USSR in different forms, such as the space race and sports, particularly the Olympics. So international sports becomes another arena of this competition. We also have the spread of communism after 1900. So one of the biggest things is the, the communist spread isn't just the Communist Party is taking over more governments, even though that's part of it, but also this idea of land redistribution spreading out. So one that you want to focus on is the Chinese Communist Party in 1949. So basic quick Chinese history. In 1911, we have a revolution that ends the dynasties. And then China fights in World War I. China doesn't get what they want out of the Treaty of Versailles. They have an anti-Western movement and what happens is China breaks into a civil war because there's the Nationalist Party, the Kumatang, who want to modernize China, but keep it independent of the West. And you have communists, the Communist Party, that wants to keep things more focused on the peasants and a total rejection of Western philosophy. So the civil war is going to go on and on until World War II when Japan invades and the civil war gets put on hold. 1945, the war is over, the revolution or the civil war picks back up. And in 1949, it's the Chinese communists that take over the Chinese government. Mao Zedong, who's the leader of the Communist Party, is going to implement an economic plan called the Great Leap Forward, which is supposed to introduce rapid industrialization. And much like the five year plans that you see in the Soviet Union, there is collectivization and there's also government policies that are going to lead to poor development of agriculture. And rather than admitting there is a problem, Mao Zedong is going to direct the exporting of grains in order to make it appear to the world that China is still productive. And what that means is that there's even less food for the peasants and less food for the people, and tens of millions are going to die as a result of the policies of the Great Leap Forward. Later in the 1960s and the 1970s, we'll have a thing called the Cultural Revolution, which attempts to pull back um, or to enforce Mao Zedong's communism on society. And anybody who doesn't toe the line of that communism is going to find themselves um, being persecuted by, by the Red Guard. So there's a big rejection of old habits, old virtues, old ideas, and old customs by this Cultural Revolution not just rejecting a capitalist world, but also rejecting the Chinese traditions of Confucianism and Buddhism, and an attempt to purge the, the society 
of these ideas that were considered out of line with the Chinese communist philosophy. For the Vietnamese, there's an independence movement led by Ho Chi Minh that has been festering for a long time. This is nothing new. And after World War II, Japan had conquered Indochina. Japan withdraws and France attempts to reestablish itself. This is going to create a military conflict. And that conflict is going to be won by the Vietnamese communists who are going to establish a communist government in the north. A Republican government is going to be established in the south. And the United States will come in to support that group. And of course, that leads us into the Vietnam War. In Ethiopia, we have a leader emerge called Mariam. And Mariam is going to adopt economic policies that deal with land reform, and he's going to cozy up to the Soviet Union for economic support. Now, Mariam's policies are eventually going to contribute to that famine that I mentioned in the last a couple slides ago. And the other idea is just land reform. So all three of these communist movements, they did emphasize land redistribution. But there were plenty of countries that engaged in land redistribution that had nothing to do with communism. For example, in India, in the province or in the state of Kerala, we see economic or policies put in place where tenant farmers get the opportunity to own and purchase land um, at a cheaper rate. And in the white revolution in Iran, so-called because it was nonviolent, nothing to do with, with white people. But in Iran, there's a policy to buy land from the landowners and then sell that land to the people at a much discounted rate as a way of redistributing land amongst the population. So land redistribution is a significant portion of this that we kind of shove in with the spread of communism. All right, decolonization after 1900. So one thing is that decolonization often has nationalist leaders who are vital to the movement. The Indian National Congress and Gandhi are gonna be critical to South Asia getting rid of the British. Ho Chi Minh is gonna be critical to leading Vietnam to breaking away from France. In Egypt, we have a general named Nasser who's gonna kind of take control in the 1950s. And one of the things he does is focus on getting rid of the Western influence out of Egypt. And he's gonna do this over the Suez Canal. So the Suez Canal was built with British and French money, but it was built by Egyptian labor. And up to this point, the British and the French operated the Suez Canal. Nasser is gonna nationalize the Suez Canal, which is gonna create a standoff between Britain and France and Israel and the Soviet Union and Egypt. Eventually, Egypt's gonna win this one. The Suez Canal will be open to international transportation but will be operated by Egypt. And in this way, Nasser can say, look at me, I stood up to those Western colonial powers that used to give us a hard time, and they backed down. So he becomes somewhat of a hero, not just to Egypt, but to that Middle East area that's still bitter about the, um, the, 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 the settlement of Versailles. And then in Ghana, which was formerly the British Gold Coast, we have Inkurma who is going to build up a sense of Ghani, Ghana nationalism and to emphasize this independence. He's also going to reject the Western society's influence and power. Now, there's different ways to these independence. There's different roads to these methods of independence. One can be negotiated. India, Ghana, French West Africa are all going to engage in negotiations with the colonial powers, eventually agreeing to a settlement where the colonial power leaves and that area now has independence. But there's also gonna be examples of armed struggle where nationalist groups are gonna fight against the colonial power. And we see that in Algeria against the French. We see that in Angola against the Portuguese. And we see that in Vietnam, again, against the French. Now, just because these countries get independence doesn't mean that the tensions are gone. And so there will be ongoing tensions with ethnic, religious, and re regional groups. For example, when South Asia is being granted its independence or negotiating their independence, there's a group of Muslims called the Muslim League who say, we don't want to be ruled by a Hindu state. We want a Muslim state. And this Muslim League eventually gains the, the creation of Pakistan. 
So now you have the Pakistan being born out of India. Wait, let me rephrase. South Asia being broken into a two-state solution, Pakistan and India. And that's going to show a religious separation. In Canada, we have more of an ethnic issue um, with the Quebecois separatists. So basically, this kind of takes off in the 1960s. Canada is breaking away from Britain. It's a very peaceful thing, but you know, Canada is no longer a colony of Britain. That's basically what it comes down to. And Quebec sees itself as not like the rest of the Canadians. Quebec sees its French culture and its Catholic culture as separate from the rest of Canada. And they're going to demand separation. This gets violent in 1967. Um, it doesn't obviously lead to anything, but there are still Quebec separatist groups that still um, argue that Quebec should become its own state. And in Nigeria, we have the Biafrost secessionist movement. In southern Nigeria, you have an ethnic group um, based out of the Igbo, um, who are a Christian group that want to break away and form their own state in the 1960s. So Nigeria gets its independence. They get rid of the British. All the Nigerians are happy, but then comes one group that says, you know what, we want our own separate state. But the Northern group, which is Muslim, says, no, you can't go. And the Southern states have oil, the Northern region does not. Oil is money. So a civil war breaks out and eventually Nigeria is kept Nigeria, but only after an ethnic-based civil war takes place. The other thing to realize is that there's newly independent states coming out of all this. And three that you want to focus on, one, Israel. And today we still see the conflict going on. At this very moment, Israeli and Palestinian forces are fighting, you know, which is threatening to become a widespread war in that region. When Israel is created in 1948 out of the mandate of Palestine, it is immediately attacked by a coalition of Arab states. And over the, uh, over the, the next decades, Israel is going to be constantly fighting for its security and protection from these Arab alliances that want Israel gone. Pakistan is another one where it's a newly independent state. And when it's created, one of the things that happens is that Hindus within Pakistan are kind of harassed and persecuted and attacked and driven out. Meanwhile, Hindus, or sorry, Muslims within India are being driven over to Pakistan. And Pakistan is arguing for a piece of land that is sitting on the Indian side called Kashmir. And that has contributed to an ongoing tension that exists between the two states. And then I mentioned earlier how Cambodia gets kind of caught up in the Vietnam War. Eventually there's a communist uprising and an establishment of a communist regime that leads to widespread genocide that is very disruptive to the Cambodian state. All right. You know what? I just realized that these newly independent states, we can keep going. So government guided economies, these new states, they want to modernize their economy, which means the government is gonna get more involved. So in Egypt, you have Nasir. In India, you have Indra Gandhi and no relationship to the other Gandhi. In Tanzania, you have Nairi, Nairi. Um, and then in Sri Lanka, um, what is her name? Banaranaki. All four of these leaders implement state-controlled economies, which borderline socialism. That's what it basically comes down to, in an effort to modernize their economies rapidly. And they come with a lot of challenges. There's going to be groups who don't like it because they feel like they're losing wealth. There's going to be sometimes unemployment. There's going to be other disruptions. And the governments are going to say, well, we have to do this, which increases government authority and power and creates um, resentment towards the government for just imposing their will on people. The other thing is that these former colonies are going to experience conflict and disruption. And a lot, some people in these former colonies are going to say, I don't want to live here. I'll, I'll try my, my hand at going to, you know, the, the mother country we used to be ruled by. And those countries are going to be called metropoles. So, for example, South Asians, 
from India and Pakistan are going to move to Britain in large numbers because they would rather give it a shot at Britain than sticking around where there's a lot of conflict and economic difficulties. Algerians, there are going to be some Algerians who go, here's a civil war going, I'm leaving. I'm going to go to um, France. Vietnamese, who don't really want to be ruled by the communists, are going to end up going to France. Filipinos are going to end up going to the United States in the 1950s and the 1960s. So this migration pattern carries on. All right. The other thing to realize is that during this time, there's global resistance to established power structures after 1900. So some of this is that the power structures decide to crack down on protests and to crack down on uprisings. So for example, in Chile, the general Pinochet, he overthrows a communist leader and establishes himself as the, the leader of Chile. And he cracks down on political dissonance through a variety of violations of human rights. In Spain, Francisco Franco does the same exact thing. Amin in Uganda becomes known as the butcher of Uganda because of the way he deals with political dissidents and ethnic groups who aren't on, on board with his policies. And then again, the AP people kind of shove the military industrial complex in. And the basic idea is that with the Cold War creating this strong emphasis on conflicts, the military industry, the military and industry have a natural relationship. The military wants more weapons, the industry wants more business. So the industry kind of feeds off of the tensions and the paranoia of this time. And this could, and since the military wants more spending on them, this could create an entity the military industrial complex that could override democratic interests. In other words, they could get policies in there that really don't pay much attention to the, the will of the people. Now, some forms of this resistance are going to be nonviolent. Gandhi is a great example of a nonviolent approach to rejecting the established power structure. He emphasized boycotts against Britain. He emphasized the homespun movement. The salt march to the sea was a way of defying British laws and British restrictions. And to Gandhi, he wants to get rid of the British, but he's not going to fight and spill blood over this. But he is going to actively resist. In the case of Martin Luther King Jr., he is also going to engage in nonviolent protests in an effort to um, get laws and get um, reforms that will provide more protections to the African-American community. And this has shown up best through the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In South Africa, which is dominated by this concept of apartheid, Nelson Mandela is going to work to resist apartheid and to call attention to apartheid. And over the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, groups are going to boycott South African businesses and going to prevent South Africa from participating in international competition with the goal of ending apartheid, which does happen in the 1990s. But then there are other groups that engage in violence. For example, Al-Qaeda. So Al-Qaeda is a terrorist organization that has used violence, particularly in 9-11, September 11, 2001, as a way of striking back against the United States. Um, the Shining Path is a communist group in Peru that engaged in violence um, against the civilian population in an attempt to, you know, fight against the government. So we see plenty of examples where there are violence, violent groups that attempt to attack the established order in an attempt to get whatever they want, I guess, whatever power they want, whatever concessions they want. Now, the last thing to talk about, and this should say topic 8.8, .8. I apologize for forgetting about that, the end of the Cold War. The Cold War comes to an end in the late 80s, early 90s. Actually, 1991 is the end of the Cold War. And a lot of this is driven by the overspending of the Soviet Union. Because of the arms race and because of the invasion of Afghanistan, those two things left the Soviet Union almost bankrupt. So... You know, there's an economic pressure on the Soviet Union to keep up with the West, and the West is outspending them. That creates an economic problem for the Soviet Union. 
And also there's just general dissatisfaction with communism in East Europe and the USSR. People were simply looking at this communist system going, we're not being provided with the life that the Western society has. Gorbachev attempts to reform these, but his reforms actually just unleash more resentment and more anger because the people go, no, you need to go all the way. Get rid of communism. In 1989, throughout East Europe, there are uprisings against communism, peaceful protests throughout Eastern Europe, and communist parties in 1989 will start to resign um, because basically they see the writing on the wall. So a lot of these revolutions are fairly peaceful, except for Romania, where the communist leader is going to be executed by, by a group of people. And then in 1991, for a variety of reasons, the Soviet Union is going to dissolve. And with that, that's the end of the Cold War. So again, one of the big historical studies is to look at causation. So when you look through this, think about how one is causing the next. That's the big thing. So how did World War I cause decolonization? How did World War II cause the Cold War? Those are the type of things you want to be able to do. Okay, last unit. Ah, I'm, I'm, I apologize that this has been going on for a while, but I've almost retaught the whole course in four videos. Unit nine focuses on globalization. So after 1900, we have advances in technology that make globalization more possible. One, mass communication, radio, television, the internet, social media. What that allows for is instant communication between the people and also less restrictions. Now leaders can talk directly to their supporters without having to go through the filter of a newspaper, for example. And social media is even more devoid of filters, even though we're starting to see some states put in filters to kind of control the information coming out there. Medical advances, particularly vaccines and antibiotics, are gonna allow for people to live longer, healthier lives. Sources of energy, we're gonna start seeing that the reliance on fossil fuels is gonna be problematic for the environment. It's also gonna be problematic because fossil fuels are non-renewables. So as industrialization expands across the globe, there's an effort to find cleaner, renewable forms of energy. One such energy source is nuclear energy, which is fine as long as nothing goes wrong. The second form of energy is what we call green energy, such as solar, wind, um, you know, those being the two primary ones. Then we have the green revolution, which is going to be where technology gets applied to agriculture. And between chemical developments that lead to fertilizers, and pesticides, as well as genetic engineering of crops um, and crossbreeding of crops, we're going to get an agricultural explosion. Now, again, the agricultural explosion has some issues that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, birth control is also another advance in technology that has a global impact because now this, this pill form of birth control that women can take on a daily basis allows them to control um, when they get pregnant. And that's going to have implications for women being in the workforce, uh, for sexual behavior of, of the whole population. It's going to have a dramatic change. And then the last advance in technology that contributes to globalization is transportation, particularly the change of container shipping. So when you think of those big containers that fit on boats, they can be transferred directly to trains. They can be transferred directly to, um, you know, rigs that can haul them. And the, the idea that I don't have to load and unload this stuff allows for the transportation to go much quicker. 90% of all global trade is done by container shipping. And that's an important one to keep in mind. Air travel, of course, helps to connect the world much quicker and much faster. So basically all these technologies start to make the world smaller start to interconnect the world much more. And after 1950, the global trade really takes off. All right, diseases after 1900, topic 9.2. So some diseases are associated with poverty, such as malaria, tuberculosis, and cholera. So malaria is a condition of exposure to the natural elements, particularly mosquitoes. Tuberculosis is a result of 
crowded conditions, uh, particularly within cities in underdeveloped regions of the world. And cholera results from unclean water sources. So that, that's why you can see this connection to poverty. Epidemic diseases are gonna spread and there's four to be aware of. 1918 influenza, which I already talked about, um, the Ebola um, epidemics that we've seen in, as early as 2000 or as late as 2014, as recent as 2014. The HIV AIDS epidemic, which is a global epidemic that starts to take off throughout the late 70s, early 80s, and really continues through, in a lot of ways, it's an ongoing epidemic. So even though we have medical technology to counteract some of the effects of, of HIV, the reality is, is your more developed nations have access to it where your underdeveloped nations don't. And since this takes place through the exchange of bodily fluids, um, you know, this, this becomes quickly um, spread throughout the globe. And then of course, COVID-19, which has spread along the travel routes that interconnect the road. And we are still dealing with this as of this video. And then there's other diseases associated with just long living. You know, since there's more time of life, there's more people suffering from heart disease and more people suffering from Alzheimer's disease. So the next thing, the debates about the environment after 1900. One, industrialization and the Green Revolution is going to change um, the way we all, it's going to alter the way we deal with the environment. With the development of the agricultural technologies of the Green Revolution, we need more land to cultivate, which leads to defor deforestation. Management of land can basically kill off the land where nutrients are, are being sucked out and basically le leaving the soil unusable, which can lead you to desertification. As we get more and more global trade and transportation, more trains, more planes, more automobiles, we can see a decrease in air quality because the release of carbon emissions into the air leads to poor air quality. And this is particularly true within developing regions today. Um, and air quality can contribute to worsening health. Increasing demand for clean water. So as I increase the, the amount of food that I'm growing, I need clean water to irrigate those, those crops. I also have more people who need to drink water, which means I need more access to clean water. And an increased competition for scarce resources, such as oil, um, and oil is the big one. But the idea is that it, it fosters competition. So as I increase industrialization, the environment is infected or is impacted, and the demands for these resources are gonna create competition between nations. And then finally, the release of greenhouse gases um, from these carbon emissions is going to contribute to climate change, which is an ongoing thing. And the idea is to recognize that the debates about the environment after 1900 say that human activity has led to these developments, has led to the changes that we've seen within the environment. It can be attributed directly to human activity. All right, economics in the global age. So one thing that to focus on is economic liberalization. So after about 1980, we see a change globally where countries start to move away from the heavily involved government run economy and more towards what we might call free trade market based economy. And that's called economic liberalization. Reagan, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Ronald Reagan is the president of the United States. Margaret Thatcher is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Both of them encourage these policies. So both of them are gonna engage in deregulation, opening up for free market trade, um, decreasing regulations, decreasing taxes, trying to cut back on government services. And as a consequence, these, those ideas are gonna spread throughout other parts of the world. China, which is a communist state, is going to embrace these economic free market policies under Deng Xiaoping. But even though he engages in this economic liberalization, and this is why China has, has gone from, in 1980, being a very agrarian, underdeveloped region to today, which it's, it's becoming the leader producer of the world, 
A lot of that is because of that embrace of economic liberalization. However, just because they embrace free economic policies doesn't mean that the government embraces free political practices. And the crackdown of Tiananmen Square or the massacres of Tiananmen Square of 1989 illustrate that point. Pro-democratic protesters are going to be violently squelched by the communist government. And so these groups were expecting political freedoms to come with the economic freedoms, and they did not. In Chile, we have something similar where the General Pinochet, with the backing of the CIA, overthrows the communist president president. And a group of economic scholars who come from the University of Chicago called the Chicago Boys are going to encourage a policy of deregulation and economic liberalization. And Chile's productivity goes up, but the, um, the distribution of that wealth is, is unequal. And then after Russia and East Europe um, and I should say East Europe, not East Europe, uh, but Russia and East Europe after the fall of communism, states like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Russia itself in the 1990s are going to embrace the economic liberalization um, philosophy wholeheartedly. The other thing to realize is that knowledge economies are going to develop, particularly Finland, Japan, the United States. What's going to develop is a demand for people to be laboring with their minds. So engineers, for example, educators, as another example, um, you know, researchers, technological develop designers. These people are working with their minds more than they're working with their hands. And that represents a change in the economies in these more developed regions. The people who are working machines and working with their hands, those manufacturing economies are shifting to Asian and Latin American nations. And so now we've got a world where things are being manufactured, um, particularly in Asia and Latin America, by a working class that's paid very low, and they're doing the, the labor, and those goods are going into the more developed nations and being purchased by people who are working jobs that are more service-oriented and more knowledge-based. We also, because we have more integrated interaction, we get new economic institutions to help govern that interaction, such as the World Trade Organization. We also get regional trade net agreements where countries will kind of pull their resources together in order to compete on a global scale. NAFTA, the North America Free Trade um, Organization or Agreement, and ASEAN, the Association of Southeast um, Asian Nations. Those are examples of where nations kind of pull together, drop trade restrictions between each other so that they can kind of integrate their economy to better compete on the global stage. And of course, we have the growth of MNCs, multinational corporations, such as Nestle, Nissan, and Mahindran and Mahindran. So Mahindran, Mahindra, and Mahindra. So Mahindra and Mahindra um, is a multinational corporation out of out of India. But other MNCs, McDonald's, Google, Nike, Disney, you, you kind of get the idea. These companies exert a great deal of influence and power throughout the global economy. There are, of course, calls for reform, not just for the, you know, there's global calls for reform. Some of these calls for reform are on the basis of race, class, gender, and religion. And one document is the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, saying all human beings have a right to access to education and freedom from persecution based on race, class, gender, and religion. Um, these Universal Declaration of Human Rights represents an effort to protect vulnerable populations across the globe, and we've never seen anything like that. The idea of global feminism so that feminist movement that we saw started with Wollstonecraft back in the Enlightenment, that has taken on a global nature, calling for um, greater economic and political freedoms for women across the globe, not just in one region. The Negritude movement is a movement within Africa, particularly West Africa, that emphasizes the cultural traditions and history of the African peoples. And the idea is the, you know, there's, there's intellectual value 
to these cultures because throughout the 19th century, these cultures were seen as primitive and backwards and underdeveloped. And what this movement attempts to do is counteract that, that um, attitude by saying, no, there's contributions that have been made and are being made by the people of Africa and the people of African descent. And then in Latin America, the Catholic Church engages in what we call liberation theology, where they focus on the needs of the vulnerable populations, even to the point of angering some local governments. Increase access to education, professions, and political roles. This is another call for reform. So the idea is to open up the, the jobs of the privileged, the jobs of the wealthy, to more people. So women having not just increased rights to vote, but also taking on political roles. Think about how I talked in the last slide about Margaret Thatcher as the prime minister of Great Britain. And we start to see an increasing number of women in significant political roles throughout the world. Increase higher education access, particularly to college level and university level education, to more people regardless of their wealth. And then in India, members of the lower caste system, because the caste had created a historical discriminatory effect, what the government has done is created what's called the caste reservation, where the idea is that jobs, admittance to colleges, so on and so forth, had to bring in a certain percentage of all the different castes in order to give people from the lower social um, groups greater opportunity as a way of um, reforming the impact of, of the caste system. And then of course, there's environmental movements such as Greenpeace and the Green Belt Movement in Kenya. Both are efforts to try and educate and improve um, the, the treatment of the environment. Now, some groups in Greenpeace are gonna get particularly violent. When sometimes you'll hear the, the phrase eco-terrorists, you know, people who are willing to engage in violent means in their idea to protect the environment. And that's certainly part of the environmental movement too. We have green parties that start to pop up throughout Europe that want to bring in policies to protect the environment through the political process. All right. Huh. Okay, this is the last slide. We have globalization or globalized culture. For example, music is going to start having global audiences such as reggae and K-pop. Now, K-pop has really helped out with social media, particularly with YouTube, as a way to give an international audience to these forms of music. And now we have a, a piece of culture that is shared globally. Television and movies have a big impact. The British Broadcasting Company or the BBC, you know, Doctor Who is being seen in the United States because of globalization. Hollywood is certainly gonna have a huge impact on disseminating a global culture. Many people across the globe know who the Avengers are. They watch the Avengers movie. And also from India, we have Bollywood, you know, which creates a global culture. A lot of this is driven by social media and social media allows for people to connect and share in immediate time. And social media is an interesting thing because now we're starting to see the regulation of social media, particularly in China where China blames the conflicts between the Uyghurs and the Han Chinese on Twitter and Facebook. So therefore China bans Twitter and Facebook and they create a state run social media platform, which is meant to kind of root out all the potential information that could undermine the Chinese Communist Party. Sports of course, takes on a globalization um, with the Olympics and the World Cup soccer. And then we have global consumerism with the advent of online commerce, Amazon being one and, oh, um, Abracadabra, no, I forget, I'm sorry, Alibaba, Alibaba, sorry, I apologize. There's another one that's really big in China. But the idea that these, these online, online platforms can lead to global access to the same marketplace, we've never seen that before. And this is going to lead to the widespread of global brands. Nike is worn across the globe um, and also a heavy dose of Americanization. So the idea is that Americanization, American values, American culture 
is going to get a global audience. Of course, there is resistance to globalization. There are anti-international monetary fund and World Bank movements. So these two economic institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, they have a tendency of lending money out to countries. But what they do is they say, OK, you can have our money, but you have to adopt these, these, these policies. And some people say that those policies help to contribute to the economic inequality and the destruction and devastation towards the environment. And these anti-globalization movements are going to sometimes get violent, as they did in Seattle in 1999, where the World Bank was attempting to meet and protest basically shut the city down. And also there's locally developed social media, Weibo and WeChat. And the idea is that you, you do see people using social media to undercut the spread of a global culture, which could undermine the authority of the local government. So for example, Saudi Arabian government uses social media as a way of harassing feminist, um, feminist groups. China essentially uses social media as a way of rooting out all political dissent. Then we have the development of international institutions such as the United Nations, which engages in peacekeeping efforts, which attempts to create a, a cooperation of the global nations to diffuse tense situations before they blow up into conflicts. And to date, the United Nations has 195 member nations with two observer nations. And these nations, the idea is for them to sit down and resolve issues before they become significant problems. There are also economic institutions such as the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, which I've already talked about, and NGOs, non-government organizations. And these non-government organizations, think of them as international interest groups, Amnesty International, Doctors Without Borders, those are examples of these NGOs where they're attempting to pursue some type of agenda on a global level. And then the idea of continuity and change in the globalized world, you want to understand and appreciate that there's been a lot of change, but we're still doing a lot of things the way we've always done it. So take, for example, something that's going on this very moment. Um, the idea of gasoline shortages. So maybe you've noticed over the past couple of days, people are panicking and they're rushing out to purchase gasoline because they see a, a threat to the gas supply that was created by this ransomware attack um, on one of the major pipelines that feed into the East Coast. Now, this may not have happened as much were it not for all these new technologies. So we have all these new technologies that interconnect us and allow this type of attack to take place. So that ransomware attack is definitely a change. But the idea that people use technologies to try and attack other people, that's nothing new. So when you look at the continuity and change, you know, when you look at how people are responding, you know, with trying to hoard, if you will, um, that that's been done before. So that doesn't really represent a big change in our behavior. So with that, if you have any questions, please reach out to me and let me know. Otherwise, good luck on the exam. Um, I hope you guys got something out of these YouTube lectures all year. That said, I'm very glad that this is the last one. So all the best. Let me know if you need anything. Bye.